Welcome back, everyone, to Next Level Snapping here with Lammy Series. Uh, my name is Peaceful. Obviously, here we got probably the best player in all of Marvel Snap right now, Lammy. And we are going to be diving into another topic for you all to help you sort of learn how to take your Marvel Snap game to the next level. I would just want to say, if you enjoy this type of content and this is something you want to see more of, make sure you are subscribed to Lammy's channel. Make sure you are liking the video. Comment down below. Let us know what other topics you would like to do because that just helps uh, just helps get this video to more people, helps us know what kind of content you want us to create. So without further ado, we are diving right into turn planning in Marvel Snap. So turn planning, for those of you who may not understand, is basically planning out a sequence for your turns ahead of time so that you sort of know what, what order you want to play your cards, how you want to play your cards, and most importantly, why you want to do that in that particular order so that you can maximize uh, your efficiency and maximize your win percentage in all of your matchups. So, Lammy, what, when I say turn planning, what does that sort of mean to you? Yo, also, what's up, everyone? It's been a great week, um, and the first video was pretty good, so I hope you guys like this one as well. So, anyway, yeah, turn planning, I feel, in Marvel Snap is very interesting. You gotta really understand your deck very well before you even play, queue up a game, because in order to plan your turn, you also need to... Uh, know what your deck can best do. I think we talked about this a little bit in the previous episode. You need to know exactly what your deck can do. So when you look at your hand, you know how to plan it, right? You can't plan without knowing what the plan, the main game plan is to yeah. begin with. So number one, got to know your deck. Because mm -hmm. like in other card games, it's like you need to plan many, many turns, right? Because there's like no limit to the amount of turns in Marvel Snap, uh, in other card games. But for Marvel Snap, it's like six turns only. So when it comes to turn planning in Marvel Snap, it's really about doing that uh, chess thing. I call it the chess thing because it's literally planning your like three, four or five moves ahead because like every turn you have like a set amount of actions, a set amount of things that you can do, right? And um, because this is only a six turn game, if you can master the art of thinking like slightly ahead, just slightly ahead, you can literally map out like almost the whole game from like turn one or turn two. So uh, do not get too complex, in, uh, complex right now. I feel like when it comes to turn planning, you need to use a few factors to identify um, what and how to plan a turn. So first thing I would like to look at is uh, your hand. So based on what you have in hand, because that's the most amount of cards you'll see at one shot, right? Because subsequently you see one card every turn. For your opening hand, that's the most you ever see at once. So looking at your opening hand, you can already start thinking like, all right, um, I have this one cost card on turn one. I have that two cost card on turn two. Maybe I don't have my turn three. I didn't have a three cost card, so... Am I gonna like hopefully draw a three cost card to play on three stuff like that? You, you just you just start looking at your hand and planning out, all right, turn one, what can I play? Turn two, what can I play? And then of course to delve a bit deeper, you think also like if my opponent plays this card on turn one, this card on turn two, if they snap me on turn one, they snap me on turn two, can my hand, can the curve that I, ha that I have in my hand right now beat that? And if I can't, will I be able to draw something? that can do do something against what they're doing, uh, stuff like that. So that's the general basis of uh, turn planning. And I would say a lot of it starts from looking at your initial hand and going from there. Of course, uh, there's also other things to consider, like uh, what you could potentially draw. But uh, that's something I think we can leave for later. Yeah. And then obviously we, we'll get into this later as well. But then like in Snap, you also have the additional layer of the locations, which just complicate everything as well, where you know turn to uh, a negative location for your deck shows up and you suddenly have to sort of start planning all right can i win in spite of this location something like crimson cosmos against uh against something like silky smooth can be really problematic uh well i guess not silky smooth because you have so many move cards but against the deck with a lot of one two and three cost something like surfer crimson cosmos is very hard to beat so then you sort of have to start planning for that as well i think you summed it up really well i don't really have much to add here uh turn planning is something that is a lot deeper than just saying, okay, like what's what am I gonna do turns one and two? It's like you said, you also need to plan for what your opponent's gonna do. So what we are gonna try and do today is sort of help you all understand both the basics of what turn planning can do to improve your game, but also some of the deeper strategy behind it and why it's important. First thing I wanted to dive into is uh, Conquest because Conquest adds another layer to this where you sort of over the course of two or three rounds, learn a lot of what is in your opponent's deck. So when um when you are playing in conquest, uh, what do you focus on more in the first couple turns? Your own game plan or trying to figure out what your opponent might doing? And uh, why do you think it's important to play it this way? Uh, in conquest mode specifically, I feel there are a few things that 
uh, that is very different from ladder, which is that because in conquest mode, you tend to have a chance to play against the same person multiple rounds, right? Because you get to, like, you have to deplete all their health to zero. So you get to see multiple rounds of their deck and you get time to uh, identify what is in their deck. Uh, how does their deck line up against yours? So I'm uh, going to give a very simple example. So let's say you're playing a deck that is, uh, like, favored into your opponent's deck. And you know this how? Because for the first few rounds, you play out the game and you realize that, hey, my deck just naturally is better than their deck, right? So if you know this, you can plan your turns in such a way whereby you can take less risk. Uh, I talked about this a little bit in the previous video as well, whereby if you know that your opponent's deck is like unfavored versus yours, you can plan out your turns such that you don't have to like uh, make such big risks. Like uh, one of the risks that I like to talk about is that playing cards in the danger room. Uh, if you are generally probably a deck that like could make and produce more points than your opponent. You might not need to commit stuff early into the danger room because uh, in general, you're going to be have more points on the other two lanes anyway. But yeah, um, this, this whole danger room thing is like a bit about risk management as well. But don't want to go too deep into that right now. Yeah, there, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? Is it pl turn planning can, it, there's like that very base level of like, you need to make sure you understand the proper sequencing for your deck. Uh, like you were talking about the thing we talked about last week, what's the best thing your deck can do? But then you also need to, you know, there's that much deeper level of trying to predict what your opponent's going to do and how that might change your turn planning. So that's that's definitely something we can get into a little bit later. Do you do you tend to, to spend a lot more time in conquest thinking about what your opponent is up to, or is that something that just depends on the ma the matchup? I think uh, a lot of it has to do with, like you said, the matchup. Because like if you know the matchup, you know um, what is their range. I think one thing that's very important is you need to know your opponent's range as well. When I say range, I mean like, okay, so let's say you see a uh, time stone on turn three. Very common example. You see time stone on turn three. It usually means Professor X on turn four, right? That's the kind of thing that people uh, like to do. So if you know your opponents, like that does that kind of thing, you can plan such that, all right, so if you see a time stone on turn three, we expect a Professor X on turn four. Where, where is this Professor X going? Where do I allocate my stats to beat that Professor X? Can I even allocate stats to beat that Professor X? So this is like turn planning 101 basics, which is you just know roughly what your opponent can do, like the best thing they can do at any point in time, and plan your turn such that uh, you want to make their best play less effective. I think I'm going to reference a half stone thing here, which is, I don't know if you guys know this half stone player, one of the greatest of all time, a uh, Colento. He mm -hmm. was really amazing at doing this thing, which is he doesn't make the most spectacular plays or like, like mind game reads or whatever, but he's very good at putting the opponent in very awkward spots. And this is because he knows how to plan his turn such that whenever he thinks that his opponent has like a certain play, he plays around it by maneuvering his own board to make their opponent's best play not as good. You know, so I think this is also translatable to Marvel Snap, whereby if you have a rough idea of what your opponent is doing, which is why it's very important in Conquest to use your early rounds to um, source out what your opponent's deck is, right? If you have a rough idea of um, what your opponent's like trying to do at any one point in time, you can plan your turn such that their best play is a little bit more awkward. Absolutely. That's that's a great point. I, It's... It's like another good example that I, I was thinking of when you were talking about the time stone example is right now, a lot of times you'll see your opponent snap, turn two, and play forge. And you know, following that is going to be probably brood or Mr. Sinister. And that just gives you a ton of information. So going into that, if you know that that's your matchup, they snap you on turn two, the first thing you should be thinking is how do I beat forge into brood or forge into Mr. Sinister? That's It's like a very, like you said, the very base level of turn planning. And it's... I think more important in Marvel Snap than in a lot of other games because you don't get to see your opponent's play till it happens, and it happens at the same time as yours. So whereas in a, in Hearthstone, a lot of times you can kind of see your opponent starting to set it up, starting to set up what they're trying to do, and you're like, okay, I know what's coming next. What can I do to beat it? And you have that like that sort of initiative onto the board. Whereas in Snap, you don't unless you you know there is priority and all that, but you, your turns play out at the same time, so you have to sort of be able to predict at a much higher level what's coming. Now, I've always found that very interesting. It's one of the things that appeals to me about Marvel Snap there. It's one of the, I think, one of the best feelings in the game, right? When you, when you perfectly read what your opponent's about to do, when you know exactly where that Professor X is going and you just absolutely destroy them, it's, it's such a good feeling. But I mean, I, think I want to just... add one uh, very important point. I feel like up to this point in this video, like the most important thing that uh, will be said, I think, is in this video, I think will be like this exact point, which I'm going to say right now. So 
Uh, we need to remember that, uh, once again, Marvel Snap is a six-turn game, right? I think I mentioned this many times, but a mm. six-turn game, what does it mean? It means that when you do turn planning, right, there's only a set amount of actions that you can do and your opponent can do, right? Because it's going to end in six turns. What does this actually mean? This actually means, right, that as much as you can be thinking like, all right, there's only so many things I can do, right? So little actions because six turns. But at the same time, it is also because there are so little actions that every single action you make directly impacts the next action, the next action. And it snowballs super quickly, right? Because one wrong action, decision, or one wrong planning will snowball into the next one. And yeah, that's it. Because you only have six turns. You only have X amount of moves, right? So in a game like Marvel Snap, I think it's even more important that you uh, focus on planning your turns, your positioning of your cards, thinking about what your opponent can do at any one point in time. Because there is no like, hmm, maybe this works, hmm, maybe that works. There are six turns. If it yeah. is a wrong move, it is very likely going to snowball into the next bad decision or bad position. So long story short, when you plan your turns in Marvel Snap, really give it a lot of thought because it's not just simple as just, oh, I'm going to play this year. Hmm, maybe it's okay. You got to know if it's okay. Because there's only six turns. There's only six actions, seven actions, stuff like yeah. that. Exactly. And each, like you said, each one can be so detrimental. Something like uh, Cosmo is an example I actually had listed where if you play Cosmo into the wrong location because you didn't plan properly and you weren't thinking and realize only later that you need to be able to play one of your on reveals into that lane, you know, it, it's too late. It's not like you can you can take it back, you know, and that. That's usually just going to be the game. Like if it's if it's something like that, you're just that's probably going to cost you a round, either a round in conquest or an entire game in ladder, and that's just that's just a huge deal. So the the level of importance on this, I think, is pretty high. I think other than snapping, the reason I went ahead and chose this topic for the next one is that turn planning is just I think where most people lose the most amount of win equity in their in their matches. I wanted to go ahead and go through an example with you, Lammy, because I think this will be probably the most th helpful thing we can do. That is something that a lot of you asked for is something with more practical examples. So what I wanted to go ahead and do is I, I got a, an image here of a game I was playing, and I'm actually going to walk you through the exact uh, situation that it was so that you kind of have an understanding. And uh, we're going to we're going to let you sort of sort of plan through what you think the first couple turns should look like, what you'll do if your opponent does X, what your opponent if, if your opponent does something else, that sort of thing. So this was a conquest match. I was playing your Silky Smooth deck, and I was playing against what looked to me from the first couple games to be a pretty standard Thanos control deck. They had Psylocke, they had Blue Marvel, Professor X, Devil Dino. We saw a Luke Cage. I'm going to assume there's probably a Claw in there. That's a pretty common card for this deck to run. And we know, all, obviously, all the stones. And this is turn one, and my opponent insta-snapped me. So like the second the turn started they snapped me so i have a pretty good feeling that they have a mind stone so let's go ahead i'm gonna go ahead and let you walk through what your thought process would be and how you would sequence the turn with the hand we have all right so based on the information that you've provided me and uh the information that i think my op what, of what my opponent might have right so standard thanos control deck and standard silky smooth deck Turn one snap. I'm gonna assume this is not high stakes first, right? Because that's another different ball game altogether. I'm just yeah, no, this is this like... is the third. I believe this is the third round of conquest. They got me for uh okay. for four cubes on the first one, or I'm I'm sorry okay. for uh yeah for. I think it was yeah they got me for no they got me for two cubes twice is what it was. So we're I'm at six and they're at ten still. All right, so um let's say this is round three. Um, this one is a little bit about risk and cube management as well. So I wouldn't really want to jump too deep into that. But like for that portion, six to ten. Uh, going into high stakes very soon, you probably want to go for a big swing back. So you might want to be a bit cautious here because at the end of the day, when you go into high stakes, the cubes compound. So having uh, sufficient cubes to make your snaps worth anything in high stakes is very important. So being in round three, you're at six to 10, I would probably take it a bit more passive. Uh, if I can win the pre-high stakes rounds here, I would. But if I cannot, I want to go into high stakes with at least like four cubes means worst case you retreat twice. So with four cubes in high stakes, you can be like win four, win four, and then win two. So technically, you only need to win about three times in high stakes to come back from a losing position. Okay, But this is just about uh, cube management. But the actual scenario you gave me, which is um, they snap you on turn one potential mind stone. So based on this hand that uh, we are seeing right now, Kitty, Angela, Silk, it's a pretty strong hand in general for the Silk Smooth deck. In fact, I think it's the second best hand because the best hand involves Craven. So they snap you on one, you have uh, 
uh, you have the idea that they have the Mind Stone, right? I would stay here because you can play Kitty on one, uh, and then you can go Angela on two into Silk and Kitty on three. It's a lot of stats, uh, a lot of early stats that could even beat a Professor X on turn four, for example. So yeah, I would stay here despite being slightly down on advantage and cubes. But you must be you got to be very ready to uh, retreat if things go to go badly. Like if things ever go badly. Uh, this early on and you know that you're going into high stakes soon you kind of need to um, you kind of need to manage your cubes and uh, save them for like the bigger swings um, but when it comes to placement on the board there is no actual way to determine just based on looking at this but I would say you want your Angela to be in like a lane that is safe right not like negative stat stats locations and stuff like that you just based on looking at this and I see the Captain Marvel you probably want your Captain Marvel to potentially fly into a lane that uh, is like slightly weaker. So maybe you would want to play the Captain Marvel into the Angela lane because that's going to get really big and then Captain Marvel can fly into an off lane which is slightly smaller. You know, stuff like this that uh, you should be thinking about just by looking at this hand. This is where turn planning is so important. It's just like you said, you look at your hand and you realize that you can put out a ton of points against what your opponent is doing. That's really what you want to, I think you want to balance, right? That's what we're, that's kind of what you're saying is you need to not just look at what your hand can do but how does that match up to what your opponent is doing like you said turn three times stones the scary thing but i i agree i think this hand can has the potential you know it does depend on what you draw craven would be nice but this hand does have the potential to beat a turn three professor x uh pretty handily depending on how things go so oh i also want to add uh this is quite interesting because uh, I remember at the start of this conversation, you mentioned to me that it's round three, right? But it's actually round two. So round two and round three is also slightly different, which is uh, quite interesting. So it is because round if you're two, on you're round, right. yeah, yeah, because if you're on round three, you can like retreat twice. For example, just just try and visualize this with me. On round three, retreat twice, uh, and then you'll be at four cubes here, right? Four to ten, and then in high stakes, it's like four cubes, four cubes, two, two cubes, three rounds, and then you come back from like a losing position. But because it's round two, because it's round two. You actually, if you retreat three times and then go into high stakes, that means you would have three cubes to 10 cubes, for example. And that means what? That means even if you snap, 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 it's still four rounds to beat yeah. your opponent. Three, 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 one, right? So it's kind of interesting. Like, this is not really part of the, like, the turn planning thing. Well, actually, technically it is, right? Uh, cube management is also turn planning, right? So yep. the difference between round two and round three is that because in round three, if you retreat, retreat, and then you go into high stakes with uh, four cubes, you can win like three rounds and come back from like a losing position. But because you're on round two, that's a bit harder because even if you retreat three times and then go into high stakes, you would have three cubes versus 10, which means you need to win four high stakes rounds. So because, okay, so what, I'm, what am I trying to get at here? What am I trying to get at here is because, um, because you're only on round two, there's a chance that you might want to go actually all in right now like and win a huge bunch of cubes because at the end of the day, if you just play passive and retreat, 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 you will have to win four times in high stakes, correct? But the yeah. thing is, if you get a swing now, whether it's a two-cube swing or maybe a four-cube swing, you would be on even ground and you would have to win less in high stakes. Because like the initial example of if this was round three means you only need to win three times in high stakes. But because if you take the passive route from round two, you need to win four times in high stakes, which is Not... a huge difference. So yeah, I know I'm this is like yeah. a little bit complex if you are not using any visual images to think about this but like if you can visualize this you realize that it makes quite a bit of sense very good yeah that, that i'm glad you noticed that because I, I i played that out a few days ago i was trying to remember off the top of my head but you're right it says right there retreat round two so good call moving on to the next uh section what are some common mistakes you see from players uh that could be helped out with proper turn planning something maybe you see from your opponents or something you've seen in games you've watched of other players Maybe some, th some things you've seen pretty commonly in the coaching you do. Okay, so this question, uh, there's actually a lot of things, like a lot. But I think for this video, I just want to highlight one. And I think it's the most important one as well. Uh, which is, people tend to... Okay, this is one I, I see on streams. I see on like, when I talk to people as well and all that. People don't tend to subconsciously plan their turns until it's turn six. You know... If you watch a lot of streams, you realize on turn six, people will start asking themselves the question, all right, where do I play this card uh, to win? Do I have to take a 50-50 here? Stuff like that. Like, people are not asking themselves these questions enough from turn one. That's one thing that I think people need to start doing because on turn six, it's just natural that you would want to think where to play your cards more precisely because that's the end of the game, right? But the caveat is that 
and like the misconception is that you need to start doing this from turn one, two, three, four, five, six. Because like I said earlier, every single action impacts the final turn very heavily. So you need to really start thinking about where each card placement should go from the beginning, right? Make it a habit. I know it's not always possible to determine exactly where everything should go because even I cannot do that. I cannot determine whether every single card I play from turn one is exactly in the correct spot. But you need to have like an idea, an assumption of, all right, uh, if I'm going to play based on the photo you showed me earlier, let's say I want this to be the Angela lane. The Angela lane is usually going to be a lane with a lot of stats, right? So yeah. if this is the lane with a lot of stats, there is a good chance our opponent will not try to beat this lane with a lot of stats, which means they need to win the other two lanes. So which of the other two lanes would they consider winning, but is also slightly weak weaker than the other lane that they want to win? You know, you got to think about this kind of stuff from the get-go. So yeah, this kind of assumptions you can make just based on your hand as well. Yeah, uh, uh, it's funny you said you mentioned that as the one thing you see players, because that's actually something that I had to make a like conscious effort to work on over the last couple months that was just a huge hole in my personal game in marble snap where in the early turns like i didn't really have a plan for what two lanes i was trying to win like i i generally have one lane that i was really focused on but there a lot of the times like the card placement for my other two lanes like i would even have some of my right regular viewers just ask like why are you why did you play that there and i would be i would sort of think about it i'd be like you know what that's a great question i'm not exactly sure and my kind of rule of thumb now is I'm okay being wrong. Like maybe I play something in the wrong place, but if I I'd rather be wrong and have had a reason to have played it there than to have played something somewhere and not be able to explain why I did so. If that makes sense, it's. Yeah. It, I, I, got, should... I got to cut in here right now because I thought of something yep. really funny. Because uh, firstly, firstly, what you're saying is as, as absolutely correct, right? Like I'd rather be able to explain why I did something, uh, like with full confidence than just like randomly do it and just somehow win and not know why because that that's not growth that's not learning right that was my but, okay the funny movement. thing i wanted <laughs> yeah the funny thing that i wanted to talk about is not this i think one of the reasons and sad truths as to why people don't subconsciously think about turn planning is because our first foray into a good marvel snap deck in pool one and pool two is uh <laughs> is ongoing destroyer that deck is the most simple yeah. two-lane deck in the world right so yeah. because our first experience with that deck uh it's with that deck, right? I think maybe some... I, I'm just thinking about it. Maybe some people just happen to just, like, not realize that because Ongoing Destroyer was such a simple just win two lanes deck, they don't start to think too much about how to plan when they start to progress into other decks. That's funny you should mention that because that is my first infinite deck was Ongoing Destroyer. It is Destroyer. mine as well. <laughs> yeah, I love that deck. That was such a fun deck, man. I, I recommend that deck to a lot of people when they're starting out. I'm like, if you get Destroyer, if you get Destroyer early just build this deck it's it's very it's, it's like you said it's a very simple deck to learn marvel snap with but it did create some bad habits for me like for sure because you know like a lot of times you get to the end of the game and you can just play destroyer wherever you need to the win because you already have one lane pretty well locked up mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah it's just you know, that's too funny yeah that was that was my first deck too let's go ahead and get to the kind of start wrapping this up what's um that's that's a really good mistake for people to play what's like what's another piece of advice you would give for players that are maybe either newer to the game or just looking to start stepping up their competitive the competitive side of their game what's another piece of advice you'd have for people as far as uh, improving their ability to plan their turns the simple way of looking at it is really really just don't autopilot like you look at your beautiful hand of like what kitty angela craven silk blah 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 like like it, it looks so good right but even this yeah. good hand can go wrong like it's it's like it's like you look at your good hand okay this is a, a bit about snapping as well like a lot of people they look at their hand beautiful snap they just snap but they don't even think about what am i gonna do with this good hand you know they just snap and then they're like okay my hand is good i snap but they haven't even thought about like, all right, where am I going to play these cards? Like, you got to really think, I think, at the end of the day, everyone at this point, after playing so much Marvel Snap, well, for the most part, can identify what a good hand looks like, right? But I think one of the things to up your game to the next level is identify what a good hand looks like and where to play the cards in this good hand. Like, literally from turn one when the first location reveals, you can determine that already to a certain extent. So, TLDR, long story short, Look at your hand, identify if it's good or bad. And if it's good, you want to snap, you want to play all your cards, think about where these might go. And you'll be surprised at how much difference that makes. One thing about turn planning that's very, very underlooked as well, because I, I feel like a lot of people after they 
watch this video, they'll be like, alright, I gotta plan my turns, I gotta figure out how to play after they snap, I gotta figure out how to play these horrible locations. But one very important thing about turn planning is that learning that you should retreat is also part of turn planning. Yeah. Like, okay, obviously the video, I mean, the photo that we saw just now uh, didn't seem too negative in terms of like staying, but like, let's just say this Nova Roma is not Nova Roma. It's actually like a Sanctum, okay, not Sanctum, Sanctorum, like maybe uh, Jotunheim or whatever, that kind yeah. of thing. I'm just thinking of something very horrible, right? Like turn planning doesn't just involve figuring out how to win in the best possible scenarios. Turn planning also is about how to retreat with precise clarity, right? Like if the person you're playing against uh, is an impulsive snapper, snap super quick without even like actually thinking about their turn. So like you said, Mind Stone, Time Stone, Professor X. The first thing you should think about is also, can my hand even beat that, right? We keep, think we mm -hmm. keep talking so far about like where to play our cards. But one thing you also need to think about is, can my hand even beat their best case scenario? And if you have cubes left, you have time to retreat, you have cubes to retreat. Sometimes just consider retreating because there's no merit in like trying to fight a losing fight if you are very sure you're not going to win, you know? So these are things yeah. that you should also consider when it comes to turn planning. Not just how to play the cards, but how to retreat. Yeah, we might have to do a video on cube management because I love I love talking about that too. You keep talking about that. It's one of those things where when I finally realized that, oh, when I'm on an even cadence and it's still before high stakes, I can just retreat for free. Like that was like mind blowing for me because once you get the high stakes, we, as long as you have more than like, you know, six cubes, those odd numbers don't matter. Like they, they I mean, they matter a tiny bit, but as far as, you know what I mean? Like once you get the high stakes, everything's even numbers. So it's a lot it's a lot safer to retreat in those early rounds and i think people sometimes get baited by the by either their hand or by what their opponent's doing and they want to say stay and see if they can beat it when you you just have free you have just free retreats you have free games where you can you can look for a better hand and yeah i, I 100% agree retreating is a huge skill in marvel snap that i think because of the nature of people and the nature of card games you just want to see what happens you know like there's that curiosity there's that like well what if i draw this what if i draw that and you don't want to play to that. You want to play to your odds and you want to play to the what the statistics tell you, which, you know, a lot of times with your really bad hands means you should just retreat. Yeah, that's why I feel like, uh, I think let's not go too much into this right now because I think like this is yeah. going to be really amazing <laughs> for another video. But like, I just want to say that like, I always believe that ever since I got into competitive Marvels, now this is just a fun fact, like I played so many card games over so many years, right? And like I've been at the top level for like multiple card games. I feel like this game... It's like the most genius one that I've ever played so far because the thing is the skill ceiling for entering this game is so simple, right? Learning this game is so easy, but the skill ceiling to like get good at this game is so hard and so high. And I feel like some of the best players that I've talked to uh, and like myself personally, that we are, we are good at this game because we understand the most important, th uh, important thing about competing in this game. It's not actually about physically playing your cards. It's actually about risk management. Like legit winning in Marvel Snap at the high level is the the most important thing is like knowing when you cannot win. I know it's gonna sound so hilarious, but like knowing when you cannot win and trying to fight and die another day or win another day yeah. is like one of the most important skills in competitive Marvel Snap. So yeah, this is probably for another day, but like this is just a fun fact as well. Yeah, I'm, I was gonna say I have so many things I want to say right now, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hold them in. We'll um mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about it after. And we'll figure out when we can do that. We'll, maybe we'll do risk management here in the next couple of videos. But yeah, it's a teaser I, guys. It's a teaser. Oh yeah. It's going to be a good one, man, because that's such an... I, I completely agree. I think Marvel Snap is one of the best designed card games I've ever played, simply for that reason that you can play it at a base level just like any other card game, and if both players never snap, it's just a lot like a lot of other card games, but when you get to that higher level, it just adds... Oh, man, it just adds so much. It's such a fun and interesting. There's so much strategy that goes into it. it, it I love it. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and sort of wrap things up. I think we've covered a lot of what I think is the important stuff is. So let's uh, let's sort of I'll let you go ahead and just kind of summarize what you think the important takeaways are from uh, from our turn planning video. Okay, so uh, we've said a lot of things, uh, mostly relevant, some not so relevant. But like anyway, the I, I think when it comes to turn planning, I just want to summarize this up by saying that like uh, you got to look when when you draw your opening hand, when you look at your hand, right. You, you can see a lot of things. You can identify immediately the simple things. Good hand, bad hand, uh, stuff like that. But try to actively look at your hand and especially the first location that's reviewed and start to think like, all right, what could this be? Like, what could this hand that I have become? You know, uh, based on the matchup, based on how your opponent snaps, based on your cubes left, based on whether you should snap. You know, all these kind of things. Like, not going to go into specifics, but like, look at your hand 
Like literally just look at your hand and think, all right, where do I want to play this, that, this, that, this, that? It doesn't always end up being perfect because your opponent also plays cards. Locations flip up, blah, blah, blah. But like you kind of just want to have a rough image in your head of what I can do, what you can do. And of course, thereafter, if snaps happen and then your opponent plays certain cards and then you just be like, all right, I guess I need to change my game plan a bit. Oh, sorry. One more very important thing about turn planning that I totally forgot, which is adapting on the fly. Adapting on the fly as well, right? You can have the perfect plan, like what I'm telling you right now, but if your opponent does certain things a bit differently to the roadmap that you're planning, you also have to play it slightly different, right? Like, it's like, okay, this is going to sound very, like, obvious, but, like, doesn't mean because you intend to play your cards all on the left into your Angela lane, but they already plopped the Cosmo down there. Does that mean you still play it into the Cosmo? Not always, right? So, yeah. you got to adapt on the fly, but what's important is you got to, like, at least have an idea of how you want things to go and then progressively adapt. A 100% agree. It's It's such an underrated skill, like, but I'm glad you brought that up because we almost missed that would have been bad. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's an important part of this, but, you know, be flexible, but at the same time, like, don't take that us saying that as an an okay to not be constantly thinking ahead and trying to figure out what your opponent does. Just because you get it wrong sometimes doesn't mean you shouldn't still be planning out your turns every turn. Because let's be honest, it's it's fine to get it wrong. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's fine to get it wrong. Uh, and you have to adapt on the fly, don't get me wrong. Like, we talk this whole video about, like, planning perfectly what to do, right? And how to allocate your resources perfectly, but it never goes perfectly, right? Yeah. So, but you have to have the plan so that if it goes perfectly, you can execute it perfectly and destroy them. But, like, if it doesn't, then adapt on the fly. Absolutely. I think that pretty much sums it up. That's great. So, uh, let's get this quick summary points. Plan out your turns before you snap. Try to think about what your opponent's doing, why they might have snapped, uh, why they might stay if you snap, what they might have, et cetera, and then be able to adapt on the fly. I think if you were doing those three things right there, you're going you're gonna to gain a lot of win shares, a lot of cube equity just by paying attention to what, what's going on and trying to plan for what your opponent's going to do. All right. Uh, I think that's all it for me. Just a reminder, make sure you're subscribed. Lammy is putting out a lot of great content. He's got this series with me. Uh, him and KM Best have an eight cube series that I, I personally have been really enjoying. Make sure you're checking that out as well. And then I'm, he's got a lot more to come. So uh, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that like button. Let us know in the comments what you thought about this video, what other topics you'd like to see us do. And uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you so much. You guys. See you.